You might be surprised to learn that the last time the guillotine was used for capital punishment was in fact on September 10, 1977. But that's a story for another day. August 4, 1875. Matthias Kneisel was born in Bavaria. During his life, Matthias was known as a local celebrity. He was an outstanding poacher, thrilling robber, and had the knack to get out of tight spots with the police. Much to their annoyance, he was nicknamed the Bavarian Bicycle Bandit. Born into a poor family, he was the oldest of six children. By the age of 16, he and other members of his family were arrested as suspects for cattle rustling. His father died in custody, and Matthias became the head of this unruly family. The family worked together, committing all manner of petty crimes to make ends meet. Matthias was arrested again a few years later in 1893. He was now 18. He was sentenced to five years. His youngest brother died in prison from tuberculosis. Matthias did his time and came out to try and turn over a new leaf. However, after working for a while as a carpenter, he was dismissed. Apparently, nobody wanted to work with an untrustworthy convict. Unable to find any work, Matthias Kneisel went back to what he did best, being a bicycle bandit. He was now older and wiser, and he had somewhat honed his skills. For over two years, he worked with a gang committing armed robberies. He was the master of fast surprise attacks. Over the years, various members of his gang were caught, but, like a fox, he was always able to outwit the authorities, prompting various folk songs to be written about him. In 1900, they attempted to arrest him again, and it turned into an all-out gun battle. He somehow managed to get away, but the results, however, were the deaths of three police officers and others with multiple injuries. He was finally caught three months later. At this point, local authorities had had enough, and over 60 police were involved in his arrest. Matthias was subsequently shot, injured, and captured. November 14, 1901, Matthias Kneisel was found guilty of his crimes. He confessed to everything but not the intent of murder. Regardless, he was sentenced to death plus 15 years. He was sentenced on a Monday, and in a hilarious comment, he states to the court, well, that's a good start of a week. The final sentence was the guillotine. This was carried out in 1902. At 7 a.m. on February 21st, he met his fate. But his last meal the night before was a healthy serving of German beer. Six glasses to be exact. I wonder if this celebrity thief had met his end feeling the effects of a hangover. Next up is Fritz Harman. They didn't write folk songs about this guy. He was pure evil. With various nicknames, the Butcher of Hanover, the Vampire of Hanover, or simply the Wolfman. None of these names are good, and that's because he was single-handedly responsible for ending the young lives of 24 men and boys. Fritz operated just like Jack the Ripper, and authorities were sure there were actually more victims. After his death, authorities indicated it could have been as many as 70. Born in October 1879, Fritz grew up the youngest in a family of six. His father, Ali, a womanizer, married his mother, Johanna, seven years his senior. She was wealthy. The marriage was one of infidelity and temper tantrums. Fritz was not tough, and he never played rough. Much to his father's disgust, he enjoyed the company of his sisters and soft games, he had a special relationship with his mother. She simply doted on her youngest son. It was said by teachers that he was a molly-coddled, spoilt boy. Not necessarily the brightest child, he gave school a try. And it was here that eight-year-old Fritz declared he was being abused. Perhaps this was a turning point in his young life, as he had to repeat the same year twice. Fritz left school at 15 and joined the military. He cut a trim, sharp figure in his uniform, but it was not to last. He suffered serious anxiety attacks, the effects of which were almost like epileptic fits. He discharged himself and went to work at his father's cigar factory. Now, at the age of 16, the evil would take over, committing horrible acts against young men. In July 1896, he was arrested for these acts and authorities decided to send him to an institute to see if it could help him. 
He was briefly transferred to Hanover Hospital to undergo psychiatric evaluation, where he was certified incurably deranged. Determined not to stay put, he escaped the hospital and managed to get to Switzerland with the help of his mother. In Zurich, he worked and lived with his mother's family before finally returning home in 1899. During this year, he met a woman named Erna. It was now 1900, and Fritz was called into military service. He served another happy year in the military and impressed his senior officers, but once again his health got in the way. Due to his dizzy spells, Fritz was once again found unsuitable for military life. He returned home once again to work for his father. At this point, he was becoming increasingly annoyed with life in general and took his father to court over working conditions. This would go back and forth as they sued each other until Fritz finally relented and settled. He received a military pension, and the happy couple set up a fishmonger business, hoping for a fresh start. His wife had become pregnant. Things did not go well, and Fritz accused her of cheating on him with a student. Since the business was in her name, she simply kicked him out. Fritz was now alone. No fiancé, no father, and his mother had passed away in 1901. Fritz would now begin a ten-year life of crime, a long way from the boy that used to enjoy needlepoint next to the fire with his mother. From 1905 to 1912, he was in and out of prison, for robbing everything from homes to graves. It was not until 1913 that he was sentenced to five years in prison for fraud and larceny. 1918. Due to the outbreak of the First World War, Fritz was allowed out of jail to help the war effort, joining the German workforce. It wasn't long before he was back to his old tricks, fencing stolen goods at the local train station. Over the years, his relationship with the law had evolved. He was a known homosexual, and the police actually used him as an informant. He would help make citizens arrests, mostly others committing fraud with their travel documents. This earned him just enough grace to go about his business not being bothered or arrested for his choice of love. So when did it really turn bad? It was between the years of 1918 and 1924 that Fritz would be at his worst, while at the same time in a steady working relationship with local law enforcement. He simply flew under the criminal radar. In 1918, Fritz committed his first truly horrific crime. It was a young 17-year-old runaway. The police, pressured by the boy's family, tracked down his last known location, which happened to be with Fritz. Police checked his apartment, and Fritz was found with another young man. In the end, he would only be charged with assault and battery. Little did police know that at that time, the missing 17-year-old runaway they were looking for was wrapped in a newspaper under the stove. Around this time, Fritz met the only long-term relationship he would ever have, with a young man named Hans Granz. Hans, after running away due to arguments with his parents, was rescued from the gutter thanks to Fritz. 18-year-old Hans was a quick thinker and used Fritz. They began a tumultuous life of crime and love. However, Fritz knew Hans was using him, due to Fritz's ongoing ties with police. They did manage to eke out a meager existence, although they were constantly on the move due to their violent outbursts, resulting in frequent evictions. All of Fritz's victims were young men, who had either been running errands for work, or whose parents had sent them to the hardware store, and then they simply vanished. Some were transient young people who had taken to the street. Sadly, some would become victims just for living in the same neighborhood as Fritz. Fritz took the remains of his victims to various forests and rivers. It was in May 1924, when children playing near the Lina River found some bones. Over the coming months, other children would find more remains, prompting a community-wide investigation. It was said that on June 8th, several hundred residents from Hanover ventured out and scoured the banks, plus the surrounding areas of the Lina River. This all led to the gruesome discovery of hundreds of bones bearing knife marks. As a majority of the victims were male, ages 15 to 20, police were quick to look at all known criminals in the area to have expressed violence towards men. 
it wouldn't be long before they turned their attentions to Fritz. June 22nd, he was seen arguing with a young man named Carl. Carl was arrested as he had false travel documents, but told the police that he had lived with Fritz for four terrifying days, during which he was held against his will and assaulted. This led to a search of Fritz's apartment, where police would find evidence of his gruesome crimes. Fritz attempted to explain it all away, but after digging a little deeper into some of his previous apartments, a nasty picture of Fritz began to emerge. The same stories from various witnesses. Lots of young people coming, but never leaving. Fritz leaves all hours of the night with bags. He left many of his victims' stolen items in storage with an old landlady. The Butcher from Hanover was one of Germany's first modern media events. The horrific nicknames and his wicked life story sold papers around the world. The judge dismissed all spectators from his courtroom, as each crime was so gruesome, he deemed it would be unfair to the surviving families or the unsuspecting stomach. After a two-week trial and 190 witnesses, Fritz was found guilty of 24 murders. His roommate, Hans, was also found guilty. One for murder, but he was also an accessory to so many others. He became hysterical and collapsed in his cell upon sentencing. Later on, Hans received a retrial due to a letter Fritz had written. He ended up serving his time anyway and died in 1975 in Germany. However, Fritz had a different response. He said, I shall go to the decapitating block joyfully and happily. At the end of his trial, he had addressed the court. Condemn me to death. I ask only for justice. I am not mad. Make it short, make it soon. Deliver me from this life, which is a torment. I will not petition for mercy, nor will I appeal. I want to pass just one more merry night in my cell, with coffee, cheese, and cigars, after which I will curse my father and go to my execution, as if it were a wedding. Not given prior warning of his execution until the night before, he was given access to a priest and received the following. One expensive cigar to smoke and a cup of Brazilian black coffee. The Vampire of Hanover was put to an end by guillotine on April 15, 1925 at 6 a.m. After death, doctors made efforts to ensure they could study his brain. Fritz stirred up many things in Germany. One was the way the police handled cases and the treatment of mentally ill criminals. Ultimately, he is one of Germany's worst criminals. If you enjoyed this, go check out our story of female inmates' last meals on death row. Thanks for watching.